Shalom, everyone, and welcome back to Hanukkah Hadis with JQD Vancouver and Tribe 12. My name is Carmel Tanaka, and I am the founder and executive director of JQD Vancouver, a Jewish, queer, and trans nonprofit dedicated to queering Jewish space and Jewifying queer space in Vancouver, BC, on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh. For Hanukkah this year, we have the honor of partnering with Tribe 12, a Jewish nonprofit whose LGBTQIA programming is for anyone who wants to explore the intersectionality of Jewish and queer identities in Philadelphia, whose lands are cared for by the Lene Lenape people, specifically of the Turtle Clan. If you do not know the land on which you live, work, and play, please check out native-land.ca. For each day of the holiday, we have a Hanukkah Hati, or two in this case, to join us and light their Hanukkah, or perhaps share another tradition and chit chat about the wonderful things they do in life for the duration of the candles burning. For candle four tonight, we have Danielle Selber, the assistant director of Tribe 12 and the creator of their signature matchmaking initiative, Danielle borrowed the best elements of traditional Jewish matchmaking and reinterpreted them to fit modern dating. She is also a graduate of Yenta Net Matchmaker and Leadership Institute and Marriage Minded Mentors Matchmaker Academy. You can find out more information at tribe12.org. Now joining Danielle is Kara Larix, a national LGBTQ plus matchmaker and date coach with Three Day Rule. She is driven by the deep desire for her LGBTQ community to experience love, happiness, and fulfillment in healthy, long-lasting relationships. She has a free database, which is being shared in the comments in her bio. And the more LGBTQ plus singles she can meet, the more she can match. Joining us live from Philly and Chicago, let's bring on Danielle and Kara. Hello. How are you? I'm so happy to have both of you here on the show. This is a very special moment uh, to have two matchmakers. You know, not, it's not often that you even meet one matchmaker, but to have two is uh, fantastic. And I thought um, before we get into all the wonderful things that you do, let's get lighting those Hanukkah candles. Danielle, would you like to lead us? Sure. Um, and you're going to light at the same time? Oh, I sure am. I don't know. Oh, did we just lose Danielle? We might have possibly lost. Where'd she go? Yeah. Well, let's wait for them to log back in. But in the meantime, um, hi, Kara, tell us about yourself. Hi. <laughs> How did this you get into matchmaking? Where'd go? <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, I'm need... sorry. That's OK. Oh, there we go. She's coming back in, you know. So I love technical stuff like this. It's all good. It's all good. You know, this happens to the best of us. <laughs> cool. It was a very dramatic exit. I know, dramatic <laughs> exit. It's like, I'm going to light these candles and I'm going to set the house on fire. <laughs> Too funny. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> the element of surprise or something. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cool. Let's yes. do this. Yes. I'm lighting my candle. Okay. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher kitchano pemitzvotam, Hutsivanu, Lehadlikne, Shel Hanuka. Amen. Oops. <laughs> Baruch Atta Adonai, Eloheinu Melechaulam, Sheasam Nisim Labotenu, Bayamim Hahem, Bazman Hazem. The end. 
Oh, how lovely. I love your candles. They're so pretty. Yeah, I was excited that I was day four so I could have like the legit rainbow, although I can't get it in, of course. <laughs> and Kara, uh, this is your first time celebrating Hanukkah? Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, this is exciting. Okay. <laughs> Keep an eye on those candles. Yeah. <laughs> Safety first. Safety first. <laughs> so I, I'm sure that there's people tuning in here who, who want to know the behind the scenes. How does one become a matchmaker? Are you uh, a teeny Todd who's like, when I grow up, I'm going to be a matchmaker? How did this come to be? And why don't we start with Danielle and then Kara? Sure. Um, so there actually is a bit of a history of matchmaking in my family, not of matchmakers, but my grandparents um, who were in Morocco, um, in Casablanca, they were matched essentially in the sense of that my grandfather got to stand, like all the women in the village stood in a line and he got to pick out his favorite one and that was my grandmother. And they were married for 80 years and had 11 children. So that was very typical for like the Sephardi Moroccan community that my family comes from. Um, so it wasn't such a foreign concept to me, but I certainly didn't have like <laughs> dreams of being a matchmaker until um, I got my master's in Jewish studies at Gratz College that's college, let's hear it in the comments, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and uh, I did my thesis on trends in secular Jewish dating. And so I just like learned a ton about dating. Um, and then I was very lucky to work for an organization, Tribe 12 in Philadelphia, where my boss said, this is not a good idea, but you should try it anyway. And so I sort of just took elements of matchmaking that had worked for my Orthodox friends, my religious friends, and it grew and grew and grew. And now it's, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Now it's a beast. What about you, Kara? How did you, uh, how did you get into this? Yeah, I was going to say, this is not something I ever expected either. I have a background in education. I taught fourth grade for 10 years. And as a first year teacher, I also came out as a lesbian and was wanting to find other gay teachers like myself. And so started a GLSEN chapter, Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. And I was in Kansas at the time. And this was actually when I made my very first match. I held a meeting and I remember Jim came to my meeting and so did Andy and you know, I'm like, hmm, they would make a really nice match. Anyway, introduced the two of them. And yeah, that's kind of when my matchmaking career started, but I went through an entire career in education, had a career in fashion. And then after my career in fashion was kind of coming to a close, I remember I had a free um, coaching session with a career coach. And I remember going on and on with her and saying, you know, I taught fourth grade and I was in fashion and I this and I that. And afterwards it was just like crickets, you know, just kind of, you know, chirping, like, I don't know how to write a resume. What do you want to do? You know, you need to focus. Anyway, she said, you know, I have a, a suggestion for you. Um, think about the common threads in your life, things that you've really loved. And no matter what career I was in, I loved working with LGBTQ youth. And then of course my peers and um, just loved being within the community. So she said, put into LinkedIn those terms that mean the most to you. I'm like, okay, fine. Hopped off the call and I did. I put in love, connection, LGBTQ community. And lo and behold, a position for LGBTQ matchmaker with three day rule popped up. So three interviews and now three years later, I've been professionally matchmaking and absolutely love what I do. Feel so fortunate to bring some light and love into my community on the daily. I am just amazed at that. That's incredible. And I'm so happy that both of you exist doing what you do to help singles uh, find love. Um, so what we're all wanting to know is what's your success rate? <laughs> how, many, how many matches? Have you, or do you have under your belt? How are you going for this time? <laughs> you want me to go for it? Oh, I'm happy to. Okay, so this is very exciting. So whenever I'm working with someone new, they always ask me this question. It's like, okay, I've been professionally matchmaking for three years now. And you know, I would really worry about someone if they were engaged after three months, you know, when I work with them for only a short time. But my success goes way back to that very first couple, Jim and Andy are still together with a little girl, Grace. And I've matched all along the way personally and then professionally just now as I'm, I've been three years into this, 
I attended a Zoom wedding a couple weeks ago. A bunch of engagements have happened recently. So um, yeah, success rate is, I mean, I don't have a statistic for you, but in terms of just great people, you know, coming together and having healthy relationships, I'm, I'm doing all right. It's all right. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. What about you, Danny? Yeah, similarly, I strive for healthy relationships. I always say I try to make sure just dating sucks less. So if somebody has a positive experience with someone I set them up with, yay, I'm done. My job is done. But of course, the matches work too. So I, I know that I have had, you know, several like eight or so marriages and like 30 or so couples. But like the the moment that was the best for me was similar to Kara's when I'm sitting in the like um it's not called an audience in the, in the, we're looking at a wedding, watching a wedding party. And not only did I introduce the bride and groom, I also realized that the grooms, uh, groomsmen were mostly people that he had met through my organization, Tribe 12, and through the Jewish community in Philadelphia. So to me, that's like the real deal. You know, you meet someone you love, absolutely, but then you also have a community that you're so close with that you can do Jewish things with or anything with. So that's the, that's the uh, icing on the cake. That's uh, great. Can I say something else oh, about sure. that? Uh, I love to hear that because, you know, sometimes people really do think of success rate as just um, marriages, engagements, babies, those things. But truly, I've matched quite a few couples who were very aligned values wise, you know, how they want their lives to look like together. And for some reason, there wasn't that little piece of chemistry or spark. But because they're so well aligned and their networks were of similar mind, love interests were then introduced from new networks. So, you know, there's no bad match it, it, if you let it lead to something. So oh, true. That's great news to hear. So we already have a comment on our, um, <laughs> on our event page and it was before the event even began and it was from someone who was like, okay, do where, like, where do I give you my information? You know, I'm, I'm single, I'm this, I'm queer, blah, blah, blah. So walk me through uh, what would be a, a typical day in the, in the office or your home office <laughs> these days uh, for someone looking to, to, to find love? Give me your best elevator pitch. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> for me, it's a little bit uh, geographically narrow and also demographically narrow. So I work, at, my organization is just in Philadelphia. We're an independent nonprofit. So um, we're a Philly-ish based organization. I always say I'll talk to anyone who will date in Philly. So I've certainly talked to people like in Boston or New York or, you know, um, as far as Florida that are willing to come to Philly for dates in non-COVID times. So happy to chat with anyone. Um, and then in terms of ages, it's 20s and 30s. So if somebody fits into some of those uh, requirements, then they can uh, just go on my website and have a chat with me, like on the tribe12.org and they can sign up for an hour long coffee date, Zoom date with me. Um, and I just like super get to know them, ask them like a billion questions and um, walk away trying to match them and also introduce them to organizations or events or community members who could help them find their match. That's great. What about you, Kara? What's your yeah. approach? Yeah, well, fortunately for my, um, I work for Three Day Rule, but I am our sole LGBTQ matchmaker. So I work with men, women, non-binary folks, trans folks from coast to coast, California to New York. Um, and I get to work with other matchmakers all around the country, like Danielle. You know, I feel so fortunate to have met you for, you know, my clients in Philly. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, I work with people from all over the place. So Canada, you're welcome to. Yes, I would love to meet you because you never know who's happy to travel internationally. Um, and I really, uh, age range, my youngest client, I would say is 26. And my oldest client right now is 66. So quite a range of ages. Um, and yeah, it's, it's pretty low key. You can go to three day rule.com backslash LGBTQ, I believe. But if you go to three day rule.com, you can find me, you know, somewhere on the website, but it's great. Sign up for a meeting. And um, yeah, we get to spend an hour together. And I ask you all kinds of things about you, all kinds of things about who you're looking for and what you want life to look like with your partner. And then there are two different ways to work with me. Um, one is the client side, which is the paid side. So, you know, I'm really searching on your behalf, wish list. And then the other side is our 
part of our free pool. So if you're a part of our free pool of Foxy singles, um, then you're eligible to be matched with any of my paying clients. So yeah, a little something for everybody. Amazing. Okay, well, why don't you give us a taste uh, of what would be your top one or two questions that you would ask someone during uh, an interview getting to know. I volunteer myself as a single queer Jewish woman of color to answer truthfully as much as I can um, and realizing that my mom is also watching. <laughs> ah, good. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a softball then. I always like to ask um, people, uh, Carmel, is there a relationship that you admire? Something where you kind of look at a couple and you're like, oh, that's what I'm looking for. And if it could be somebody you know, or it could even be like TV, movie. Wow. Well, I feel like I, I have to come up with something good because I'm on live air right now, but uh, I would have to say my parents. My parents have been married for over 40 years and uh, it's, it's rare to still have friends uh, whose parents are still together. Not that I feel like that's the, the only way to happiness, but I feel like they've managed to, to find a way to coexist together and to also to defy um, against all odds to be together. They came from very different worlds. My dad's Japanese Canadian and my mom is Israeli, uh, moved to Canada and you know, weren't accepted for one being a, a mixed couple, an interfaith couple, which is something that we were talking about earlier before we went on air is how to navigate dating when you belong to multiple communities and you have multiple identities, it gets really complicated. So to weather, uh, to be able to weather uh, many storms together. And I think that would be something that I would strive for. Beautiful. Yeah, good answer. All right, what's <laughs> next? Yeah, okay. So my favorite question to ask is, um, based on everything that you know about yourself, based on past relationships and people that you've been attracted to or people that you've dated, um, talk to me about your fairy tale going forward. Who would be a really great match for you and take that in any direction you want. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I follow uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, personality, Enneagram type things. I'm a type eight, which means I'm definitely a type eight personality. I'm extroverted. Um, I'm a gut type. Uh, I definitely have a lot of feelings and I am very quick to make assumptions. So my fairy tale moving forward would be uh, to have a life partner, uh, a long-term relationship uh, to, to help calm some of the storms. Uh, so I'm okay with someone who's introverted, uh, but someone who's also independent and it's totally okay if you need time to relax and to be separated. We don't need to be together 24 seven. In fact, I prefer not uh, because I lead a busy life. Uh, I wear multiple hats and I'm constantly busy doing a variety of different projects. Um, but to be able to, to listen, to be able to support one another and to create uh, a safe haven um, and also in the mountains skiing, um, <laughs> we're putting in all of the other, other things. That would be great. Yeah, someone who's a badass skier done. Nice. I love I, the dynamic that you're describing. I love to uh, call it the, the rock and the star, where the rock tends to be a little bit more grounded behind the scenes and sometimes can tether that star. And it sounds to me like you might be the star and you're looking for your rock. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> There's a little person. So all you rocks out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, hmm, okay. Uh, do you think your mom will slightly cover her ears for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably not, but go for it. I'm all game. I mean, my six-year-old is here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to ask everybody some, like, very, very, uh, what for some people are basic questions about, like, gender identity and who you date and how you date and what you're looking for, right? So some people are like, huh, that's so, so simple. But um, one of the questions I ask that kind of gives everyone pause is I ask, do you experience sexual attraction? And if so, to whom? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I know that's not the case for everyone. And so I also really respect uh, if you're looking for more of an emotional attraction um, or an intellectual attraction. 
uh, I would say it's a combination of probably, I think, sapiosexual is how I would describe myself. And I have in dating apps before. I, I do need to click on an intellectual level first uh, before it, I feel like it can be physical for long term. Uh, but of course, there's physical attraction and you know that gets the the job done for the meantime but it's not it's not long term and i am looking for long term okay. all right last question from kara <laughs> okay well then i go the opposite of the fairy tale and i usually ask um okay talk to me about your non-negotiables you know things that are just absolutely off the table for you and i hear all kinds of things from i'm allergic to cats to um i i'm a meat eater so dating a vegan is probably not a good idea to smoking i mean you name it i hear all kinds of things wow okay well i feel like i'm a terrible person if i'm creating a list which I already did with my fairy tale, but at the same time, you know, I, I do have a list. I think a lot of us do. Mm -hmm. um, so the list would have to be a cat person for sure, because I am a cat person and I'm planning to adopt after the ski season, uh, a little fuzzy munchkin of my own. Um, definitely an omnivore. I'm Asian, I eat everything and someone who does not keep kosher. Um, let's see. I think being independent, financially independent would be a big one for me. Um, I am financially independent myself and I'm not in a position to be able to pay for someone else to, to live. Vancouver is a very expensive place to have a roof and have food on the table. So that's definitely uh, a factor. So a job and one that pays the bills um, and a really wonderful communication style. And I know that there's many different ways to communicate and I can try to, to roll with any style, um, but someone who listens and someone who, who knows how to um, be direct. I need to, I need to hear it, um, what you need to say. And I don't like running around in circles. I just need to be told this is where I'm at and I can, I can work with that. Very good. All right, I'll be looking for a direct rock for you. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so into it. <laughs> now, Kara, at this point, this is where sometimes I push back just a teeny bit, like, and I would say something like, um, I, I would ask, like, if you need somebody who indeed does, like, eat everything that you eat, or is it just somebody who won't bug you about what you're eating and they can do whatever they want? So there's, like, some subtlety there sometimes with non-negotiables, right? I mean, like, to share my family's recipes and to be able to eat a meal together is so important. Um, and mm -hmm. food really is important in my life. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of my identity is in the foods that we cook as a family and share. So yeah, it's non-negotiable. Good. Listen, That's I'm a type eight. All these non-negotiables really are. There's no room for variation on them. <laughs> But Danielle, you bring up such a good point because truly this is the beauty of matchmaking is being able to have these kinds of conversations and learn the nuances of what is a non-negotiable or a must have. And you're right, there's so much gray area. So yeah, asking further probing questions, I'm a big advocate of. Yeah. Which is great. And I think this was a really wonderful exercise uh, as an example to, to let people who are going to be watching this video know what to expect from matchmakers. Because, you know, the, when I think of matchmaking, uh, immediately uh, matchmaker, matchmaker, for the Yenta character from Fiddler on the Roof comes to mind. Um, or I've heard, oh, that's super old fashioned. But really, is it? Go oh, ahead, Dave. No, it is not. I mean, I think... I think what's amazing is that until literally, at least for my family, like one to two generations ago, matchmaking and, and uh, arranged things, or at least having your family like help out was the norm, right? So for me, I don't see why somebody wouldn't want somebody else in their corner, you know, like working for them, thinking about them, just like feeling like you're not alone in dating. Because I think that especially during this pandemic, like people have just felt like helpless about it and just saying like, okay, as if dating wasn't hard enough now, like I can't even like go to a bar. I can't even see anybody. So um, uh, what, like I've been, you know, I, I read all the studies about dating and trends and stuff. And I mean, matchmaking has exploded during this time. And there's a reason it's because people are like, oh, if I want to do this, I need to like really, focus in and I need some help. Yeah. 
I, I agree. There's no more um, work conferences to go to right now or backyard barbecues or parties where you're perhaps going to meet somebody new. So matchmaking really has become a great alternative to app dating or, you know, even in conjunction with app dating. Um, you said something else that I wanted to jump off on. That was such a good point. Um, I, I think as a matchmaker, something else that's really beneficial having, you know, a wing woman or somebody on your side to navigate the dating process is that sometimes you've been doing something over and over and over again in your dating life and you just don't know, you know, if things aren't working out, no one takes the time to tell you, hey, you went out on this great date and you had a blast but you didn't realize that perhaps the other person was asking all the questions and you got to just go on and on about your life and walked away feeling fantastic. And you never received the feedback that maybe the other person didn't feel like they got equal airtime. And so therefore that wasn't mm. sexy and you know, whatever. And so having a wing woman or somebody on your side, you can really deliver some real time intel from your match, which can really help you break patterns that may be holding you back and you don't even know about them. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling that. So I seem to be attracting a string of potentially emotionally unavailable humans at the moment. And so that is something that uh, I need to also look into. So I will ask you off air what might be the, the root cause of that. But uh, in the meantime, we uh, have some a fun giveaway for those who are tuning in. Uh, for the fourth night, uh, we're giving away four copies of the newly published Virtual Dating your guide to a relationship in a socially distanced world by fellow matchmaker and Tribe 12 fellow, Eliza Ben Shalom. So this is how it's gonna work. We have a trivia question and the first four to give the correct answer in the chat below will win a copy and it'll be sent to you. So I hope you are listening. This is what the trivia question is. Do you say that this Oh, do you say that, this, oh my gosh, I can't even talk anymore. Anyway, Jews say this at nearly every Jewish holiday. Complete this popular Jewish saying. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I'm gonna repeat that one more time. Jews say this at nearly every Jewish holiday. Complete this popular Jewish saying. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's dot, dot, dot. All right, so the first four to uh, leave the correct answer in the comments below. We'll receive a copy. And uh, in our last few minutes together with uh, our lovely guests, I thought uh, maybe it might be a good idea to ask a question on what advice would you be giving those who are still searching for love? Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I feel like I have to give advice for this moment in time that we're in right now. Um, you know, I think that I, what, so the trends that I've seen and the trends that I think are good to like jump in on are things like um, location mattering a lot less to people, right? Kind of like what Kara said um, at the top where the person that you're, that you're meant to be with is not necessarily like in the, in your tri-county area, right? Um, and so I've had people in the past say, not just that they want someone in Philadelphia, but they actually want someone like between this block and this block, or they won't cross Broad Street, right? Like that's real. But now, especially for the college students now, like if you've heard of this, uh, there's a dating site called OKZoomer, okay and it's for college students, and it's not location-based at all. So this upcoming generation who's, who is going to be dating and like, two years and coming to me and Kara are not caring as much about location. So that's good, right? And then there's also a lot less um, stigma to like getting help with dating, right? So like whether it's a matchmaker or having someone write your dating profile or even having your mom like do matching for you. Like there's a new website called Just. Oh my gosh, don't say that. Well, She's I gonna be right on that. <laughs> <laughs> your mom's gonna be like, you're, I mean, you should see she's like great I'm Carmel's mom I'm looking for a partner for her listen she's mm -hmm. already on it <laughs> yes and and yet you're not like totally embarrassed and like cringing in fear because uh I think that dating like the idea of having someone help you date has just become like okay you have help with everything you have a personal trainer or whatever you have someone cook your meals if you want and you have a someone to help you with dating maybe it's your mom maybe it's someone else I mean, so if anyone's going to find me someone, it's, it's probably going to be her. She knows me the best. Okay, so she should go on this new website. It's literally moms searching for their kids. They make the profile everything. It's hysterical. Did yeah. you hear that, mom? <laughs> <laughs> um, and right. my last thing I'll say 
Say hi, Abby. Hello. <laughs> hi. The last thing I'll say is that, um, and it touches on a point that we made earlier in regards to like interest and deal breakers, like deal breakers are great and they actually help, at least for me, help me to like hone in on what someone's looking for. Just make sure that you have thought about your deal breakers and make sure that they are truly what they are. So my favorite example is like, if you're like, I love tennis and I could never date someone who doesn't like tennis, right? Because like interests, a lot of people kind of try to find someone quite like them. For me, I would ask a follow-up question. I would say like, what is it about tennis, right? Is it that you played with your dad when you were younger? Is it that you are really competitive? Is it that you're super sporty, right? Because if it's all those answers mean a totally different thing and have nothing to do with tennis, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's just about that personal exploration, like check in with yourself and be like, what am I actually looking for? Because I think often people are surprised when they ask themselves like one more question. <laughs> Well, I'm already thinking when I said skiing is definitely, you know, skiing with my dad. It's something, an activity that we've done and it's my favorite activity of all time. Mm, so, so that could go back to your family value. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. I already learned something today. All right, Kara, what's your advice? So good. First of all, ditto to everything that you just said. It's fantastic advice. Um, yeah, you know, I want to speak to the moment a little bit too. And I think if ever there was a time to really open up your parameters in all senses of parameters, um, you know, dating two streets away is starting out the same way as dating two states away right now. So why not cast a wide net, use this time to really experiment and really find the best match for you, not the most geographically convenient match for you. So I think now is a good time to explore different ways to get to know people. And then just in general, and I would say this, you know, during this time or any time, but so much of really finding the right human for you starts with you. And I don't mean this in a woo woo way. I mean, I really mean that figuring out, taking the time to figure out what works for you, what makes you feel good, what sets your soul at ease um, and consider family values. And like the holidays right now, how do you enjoy the holidays? How do you like to celebrate? You know, those types of things are really important when finding somebody who's super compatible. So kind of do your own self-assessment first, and then it's all about mindset. You have to consistently believe that your person is making their way towards you and you have to be prepared and ready and open for when they show up in your life. So that just looks like having a hopeful attitude an excited attitude about dating and just this kind of no expectations, but wide open sort of like, I can't wait, curious attitude about who you're about to meet. Um, I think that takes people really, really far when it comes to dating and really allows you to have the right person show up for you without holding yourself to a specific list. I will always say, do you want to go to bed at night with a list or with an incredible human? So, you know, you can kind of, after you've done all that good self-work and you have a vision in your mind, you can let go of that list and then just be open to the possibility of your person walking into your life at any time. Beautiful. Oh my gosh. Excellent advice. You've given me renewed energy to uh, get back in the dating pool. I'm single, ready to mingle. Um, thank you so much, Danielle and Kara, for joining us today for Candle Four of Hana Kahati's with JQD Vancouver and Tribe 12 in Philadelphia. Be sure to follow both their works. There's links in the comments below. Uh, thank you again to our partner organization, Tribe 12. Uh, next up, we've got Candle Five with a Queer uh, Persian Jew, Arya Marvazi, Managing Director at JQ International in Los Angeles. Uh, that will be at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I believe that's 7 p.m. for the others. Or actually, no, I think I might have that wrong. It might be 12 p.m. You know what? Check back on our <laughs> event page and you will see that. Anyway, looking forward to having you all join us again. Happy Hanukkah and Chag Hanukkah Sameach. Thank you for having us. Take care.